Hello everyone, I'm Grace Beatty and welcome to Wicked Women, the podcast. Step back in time with me as we learn about some of the most infamous and maligned women in history. Speaking with leading experts, I will discuss these women's backstories and the circumstances that gave them the title of Wicked. In this season of Wicked Women, I will be focusing on some well-known and some lesser-known women in history who have acquired an unsavory reputation. This season will analyze the lives and legacies of Alexandra Fyodorovna Romanov, the last Tsaritsa of Russia, Queen Mary I, more popularly known as Bloody Mary, Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, who was executed for adultery, Empress Wu Zhao, also known as Wu Zixian, the only Chinese empress to rule in her own name, and Empress Theodora, a former sex worker who became empress of the Byzantine Empire. In the end, this podcast does not look to excuse or dispute the wrongs committed by some of these women, but it is also not looking to completely villainize them. Instead, I hope this can be a conversation starter on the complicated legacies prescribed to women in history. In today's episode, I will be discussing the life and legacy of Tsaritsa Alexandra Fyodorovna Romanov, the last Tsaritsa of Russia. Joining me today will be best-selling author and historian Helen Rapoport and James Bolton, the creator of the podcast series The Queens of England and the Other Half. Keep listening to learn more about Alexandra Romanoff and her fascinating story. On the 6th of June, 1872, Queen Victoria's 22nd grandchild was born. Princess Alex of Hesse by Rhine was a bubbly child nicknamed Sunny by her family, but her life would be blighted by tragedy. Alex, titled Tsaritsa Alexandra Fyodorovna Romanov after her marriage, lived a life of contradictions. Her life was both a golden fairy tale and an inescapable tragedy. She fell in love with a dashing prince who loved her passionately, yet he was doomed to be the last czar of Russia. She had five beautiful children, but her longed-for son was cursed with the fatal disease of hemophilia. She and her family were surrounded by luxury and golden palaces, but it would all come crashing down around her and end in blood in a cellar in Siberia. Alexandra Fyodorovna Romanov had the makings of a golden childhood. Born into a loving family, Alex, as she was known, thrived. She was the sixth child and fourth daughter of the Grand Duke of Hesse, Louis IV, and Princess Alice, the third child of Queen Victoria. Alex was a gentle, compassionate, and intelligent child. Alex's older brother, Prince Frederick, Fritty to his family, suffered from hemophilia and died from a fall when Alex was one years old, a terrifying foreshadowing to her future. Her mother wanted to instill in her daughters the importance of public service, and often took them to local hospitals and charities. When Alex was six, an outbreak of diphtheria swept through her family, claiming the lives of her little sister May and her beloved mother Alice. When Alex herself recovered, a shadow fell over the once bubbly child that would remain for the rest of her life. Zarevich Nicholas wrote in his diary in 1891 that, My dream? One day to marry Alex H. I have loved her for a long time. Nicholas stated in his diary and to his family that he fell in love with Princess Alex of Hesse by Rhine the moment he met her at a wedding in 1884. Both families were against the match. Nicholas's parents, Tsar Alexander III and Tsaritsa Maria, believed that Alex was cold, 
and far too inferior in status to be the wife of the heir to the Russian throne. Alex's grandmother, Queen Victoria, meanwhile, was deeply suspicious of Russians and feared for her granddaughter living in a country with what she viewed as an unstable government. Alex herself felt unprepared for the role she would be expected to play as Nicholas's wife and consort. However, as historian Helen Rappaport states, She really loved Nicky, and I guess it's a testament to how much she loved him. But she was prepared to go through all that because other German brides before her in Russian history had been the sacrificial lambs sent to Russia to marry into the Romanov family with, with no chance of being in love or falling in love. It was an absolute dynastic marriage of convenience. At least hers was for love. And I think that's what kept her going. Nicholas and Alex's romance played out in its early days as if from a fairy tale. Obstacles continued to come into their path, and yet their mutual, passionate love overcame all. Regardless of the fairy tale love story, Alexandra did not have a warm welcome as the new Tsaritsa of Russia in 1894. She was only recently engaged to Nicholas when his father fell gravely ill. Summoned to Russia to provide support to her fiancé, Alexandra arrived only in time to receive Tsar Alexander III's blessing to marry his son. Nicholas, now Tsar, married the newly titled Alexandra Fyodorovna three weeks after his father's funeral. The deeply superstitious Russian populace looked upon Alexandra's arrival ominously. A lot of sort of superstitious things were read into her, her arrival as Saritza, for example, you know, she was called the funeral bride because, because they got married literally on, on the back of the funeral. So, but, you know, people saw signs in this that she brought bad luck to the Russian monarchy and that kind of stigma stayed with her. People felt that the Tsardom was doomed with her arrival. Alexandra's natural reserve and stubbornness did not endear her to the Russian people or aristocracy. In a letter to one of her few close friends, Princess Marie Beratinsky, Alexandra stated, I must have a person to myself if I want to be my real self. I am not made to shine before an assembly. I have not got the easy nor the witty talk one needs for that. I like the eternal being and that attracts me with great force. I think one's initial knee-jerk reaction to her is what a very difficult, prickly person she was and that she always seemed so hostile and so on the defensive all the time and that, um, you know, she was a woman one disliked almost. Um, it takes It takes a very long time to get to know her and understand her because she was a very private person. She didn't really give away her personal feelings at all because except to a very 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 close circle of trusted friends and courtiers I mean so small literally enough people to get round a dining table she only had very few trusted friends who she really confided her feelings in so the problem Alexandra created for herself I think the minute she arrived in Russia was that she was felt quite hostile towards what she th perceived as the decadent Russian court. And she didn't want to have had anything to do with it. She was also pathologically reserved. People say she was shy. No, I don't think she was shy. She was extremely mistrustful, reserved, and didn't give away her true feelings or anything of herself to people she didn't know. So therefore, it was very easy from the moment she arrived in Russia for people to misinterpret her behavior as being hostile and cold and unfriendly. Whereas in fact, she was really trying to protect herself. There she was flung into this enormous, elaborate court with its protocols and its cliques and its favorites and there she was a, a very simple very modest German princess from a pretty much down market duchy um, so she must have felt terribly like a fish out of water. 
Despite her widespread unpopularity, Alexandra's married life was ideal. She wrote in Nicholas's diary on the 16th of November, 1894, Never did I believe that there could be such utter happiness in this world, such a feeling of unity between two mortal beings. I love you. Those three words have my life in them. By 1901, Nicholas and Alexandra had four beautiful, healthy daughters, but Russian law stated that only a male could inherit the Russian throne. Alexandra's popularity fell even lower with her perceived failure to provide an heir. In her desperation, Alexandra turned even more to the Russian Orthodox faith and began relying heavily on mystics and faith healers. In the summer of 1904, Alexandra's long-awaited son, Alexei, was born. However, the joy did not last long, for within a few months, Alexandra's greatest fears were realized when it was revealed her beloved son had hemophilia, a rare genetic disease where one's blood does not clot properly. Hemophilia is a horrifying, incurable disease in which any minor bump or scrape can cause uncontrollable bleeding, intense pain, and possibly death. The disease can also be emotionally agonizing for the parents. For any parent, it is excruciating to watch a beloved child in pain, especially when you can do nothing to ease the suffering. Alexei, a naturally precocious child, often experienced hemophilic attacks. As historian Robert K. Massey states in his famous book, Nicholas and Alexandra, when he hemorrhaged into a joint and the pounding pain obliterated everything else from his consciousness, he still was able to cry, Mama, help me, help me! For Alexandra sitting beside him, unable to help, each cry seemed a sword thrust into the bottom of her heart. Alexandra's niece, Maria Pavlovna, remembered in her memoirs that the Empress's character underwent a change and her health, physical as well as moral, altered. Nicholas and Alexandra did not reveal Alexei's disease to the Russian people for fear that he would be seen as a weak, incapable heir to the throne. By hiding Alexei away, Alexandra retreated from public life even more than before. Here's historian Helen Rappaport. So because they hid the Alexei away, the Russian people never knew him. And by association, they really didn't know much about Alexandra because she was reclusive. She wanted to protect her boy. She didn't like being out um, in public, in the public under scrutiny. She avoided uh, doing these ceremonial events increasingly because she was also quite sick herself with one thing or another. She dropped out of more and more official functions. And as the girls grew older, they took her place. So in fact, the people didn't see much of her or of Alexei. The assumption was made, oh, because she wasn't there and she didn't turn up for things, she didn't care or she wasn't interested. And that wasn't the case. She, she misguidedly thought the Russian people loved her and Nicholas. With no explanation, the Russian people began seeing Alexandra's increasing isolation as proof of her arrogance and disdain for Russia. As Robert K. Massey states, the years of worry left a look of sadness settled permanently on her face. When she spoke to people, she often appeared preoccupied and deep in gloom. Her own public appearances were reduced. When she did emerge, she was silent, seemingly cold, haughty, and indifferent. There has been a general agreement among most historians that Alexei's hemophilia and his parents' subsequent decisions about it from isolating themselves to bringing Rasputin into their lives, helped bring the Russian monarchy to its knees. I think what brought the monarchy down undoubtedly was that Alexei was a hemophiliac. And that because of that, her major preoccupation was firstly to protect him so he didn't harm himself and have an uncontrollable bleed. But also she became absolutely obsessed with exploring all these gurus and faith healers and people in in a desperate attempt to find a way of curing him or treating him at least which led her first of all to monsieur philippe who was a 
a dubious French quack. And then to Rasputin, who was quite different. I don't think Rasputin was a quack at all. I think Rasputin probably had extraordinary gifts. But of course, he was the person everyone in Russia loved to hate. And by association, because she fell in with Rasputin, trying to protect Alexei, everybody turned against her. Nicholas and Alexandra consulted every medical professional and specialist in an attempt to find a cure for their son. With no cure in sight, Alexandra turned towards her faith for help. Thus entered the person instantly recognizable in the Romanov story. His eyes a startling shade of blue, his peasant blouses belted at the waist with a large cross hung across his neck, and his shoulder-length hair scraggly. If you haven't already guessed, the man named Rasputin has become almost a mystical villain, more monster than man. Titled the Mad Monk for much of history, Rasputin held a power that to this day no one can explain. Was it hypnosis, a placebo effect, or a genuine gift? No one knows, but what is known is that he was able to ease Alexei's excruciating pain and Alexandra's overwhelming anxiety. The family came to rely heavily on Father Gregory as they knew him, and he was often seen entering the palace at all hours of the day or night. Within the walls, he would pray with the family, providing spiritual guidance. When Alexei was ill, all Rasputin needed to do was pray over the boy, and he was seemingly healed. Stories soon began to spread about Rasputin's heavy drinking and womanizing, but Alexandra would hear none of it. This man, whatever his personal failings, could heal her precious son. However, with no explanation given to Rasputin's visits, assumptions were made and rumors were begun. The wall of secrecy erected around the family left them vulnerable to these rumors, and it undermined the nation's respect and confidence in Alexandra, the Tsar, and the entire monarchical system. Without the knowledge of Alexei's disease, Alexandra's reliance on Rasputin was never understood by the Russian people, and all manner of reasons were brought forward. Throughout her lifetime and since, it has become difficult to divorce Alexandra's legacy from Rasputin. Helen Rappaport emphasizes this by stating, her name has been inextricably linked to Rasputin. There is still this absurd perception of him as the mad monk, which is nuts. He wasn't mad and he wasn't a monk. But it's lowest common denominator history, you know, the same old cliches get trotted out. They would pass secrets to the Germans. Would, and then the awful sexual accusations and the horrible salacious cartoons of them that were in circulation and she was much maligned and it, and the absurd overkill the accusations unfounded accusations the gossip the scandal the rumor it stuck it stuck right through the 20th century and even now it's really hard you feel like sometimes you're beating your head against the brick wall of the public perception the old myths persist so it's a mountain to climb to get people to look at, look at Alexandra differently. And she took everything on trust. And maybe if she'd be more critical, she wouldn't have been left stained with that association with Rasputin, but she wouldn't have a word said against him. During Alexandra's time in Russia, the monarchy was absolute. Parliament, called the Duma, could be called and disbanded at the Tsar's will, and most of the common Russian people couldn't vote. Despite being the granddaughter of one of the most famous constitutional monarchs, Alexandra encouraged Nicholas to stand firm against the growing calls for reform in the beginning of the 20th century. Alexandra did not believe that Russia or its people were ready for a constitutional monarch. More importantly, she was determined to see autocracy passed in full to her son. Alexandra's popularity hit an all-time low during World War I. German by birth, she was almost immediately suspected of having divided loyalties and passing on military and government secrets to the Germans. 
throughout the cities of Russia, she became known as the Niemka, or the German woman. Despite the rumors and the animosity, Alexandra threw herself into war work. Not enough is known about her devoted war work. Uh, her and the girls, what they did during the war. She very much was the inheritor of her mother Alice's nursing and humanitarian instincts. And in a way, that involvement in the war, the hospital, the nursing, took her out of herself, made her forget her own preoccupation and pain and suffering. And she did suffer from a lot of physical ailments. She, she was not a well woman. I think she probably was in a lot more pain than we really know. But her work during the war was tremendous. I mean, the hospital trains, you know, the setting up um, centres in all the palaces to collect bandages and supplies, medical supplies, organising that. But again, she didn't advertise it. She, can, You know, she didn't go running, running around saying, aren't I wonderful? Look at all this nursing I'm doing. She just got on with it. But people don't know about it. Alexandra dedicated herself to many humanitarian efforts during the conflict. She ordered that the major rooms in the Winter Palace be converted into hospital wards, and a number of smaller hospitals were opened on the property of their family home, Tsarskoy Selo. Within months of the declaration of war, Alexandra and her two eldest daughters, Olga and Tatiana, began training with the Red Cross to become nurses. Alexandra refused to be addressed by her royal title, instead preferring to be known as Sister Romanova. Alexandra was often ill and anxiety-ridden, but she thrived as a nurse. Alexandra stated in a letter to Nicholas, Looking after the wounded is my consolation. To lessen their suffering, even in a small way, helps the aching heart. In 1915, Nicholas took control of the Russian army and left for the front. He named Alexandra as regent. Her time as regent has become notorious. She relied heavily on Rasputin's guidance, despite his lack of political training, hired and fired government ministers at astonishing rates, and sent persistent letters to Nicholas with military advice and urging him to be firm with his ministers. Podcaster James Bolton, who created an in-depth series on Alexandra, states, She knew her own mind, and she also knew she was married to a husband that didn't. And I think she really saw her position as being someone who could steady him, who could make sure that he went in the right direction. And they had very similar values. They both firmly believed in autocracy. They both firmly believed in his position as, you know, God's appointed ruler. But there are some amazing statistics about the numbers of ministers she went through in her time in charge. Um, you know, seven, I think there were seven agriculture ministers in the space of about a year and a half. And you can see, because there are these letters that survive of just these, you know, don't like him, don't like him, you must fire him, you must fire him. She's even getting in charge, getting involved in the movements of troops in the war, which is something she has no experience of and should not be getting into. In a letter to Nicholas in the spring of 1915, Alexandra writes, You are too kind and gentle. Sometimes a good loud voice can do wonders and a severe look, do my love, be more decided and sure of yourself. They must remember more who you are and that first they must turn to you. These actions have helped bolster the belief that Alexandra had a direct hand in the downfall of the Romanov monarchy. Here's James Bolton. She has a bit of a reputation, seen as, you know, this bossy woman, um, this woman who brought down the Romanovs. And a lot of these views uh, go through sort of quite gendered lenses as well, as it so often does with women in power. You know, she ends up in control, essentially, of the Russian government during World War I. She's the only woman in a significant position of power at all in this whole conflict. And again, that's really fascinating to see how she dealt with that. And, spoiler alert, very badly. In 1916, Rasputin was murdered, and Alexandra's hope and resolve wavered as never before. Rasputin had once told her that if he was killed, she would lose her son and her crown within six months. After days of mourning and heartbreak, Alexandra rallied and steeled herself for the downfall that she viewed as inevitable. The next year, amidst growing unrest, Nicholas abdicated the throne for himself and on behalf of his son, Alexei. The Romanov family became prisoners at their home in Tsarskoy Selo. 
With their political and royal life at an end, Nicholas and Alexandra were able to deepen their already passionate love as they drew strength from each other in captivity. Helen Rappaport points out, Fundamentally, they were just an ordinary family, you know, a pretty devoted ordinary family, but they had very simple interests. They, you know, they liked doing things together. And, and, and in that sense, that unity, that l- mutual love and support was what kept them going in captivity. Nicholas took on his new role much easier than Alexandra. A naturally proud woman, the lack of respect and at times open hostility was hard for her to bear. The health and strength she had found during nursing and after Rasputin's death completely abandoned her. Confined to a wheelchair most days, thinner than ever before, and almost completely gray, the former Tsaritsa struggled to accept her new situation. The next month saw the family moved deeper into the Russian countryside, and Alexandra drew deeper into herself and her faith. In a letter to one of her close friends, Anna Virbova, Alexandra explained that We live here on earth, but we are already half gone to the next world. We see with different eyes. I want to be a better woman, and I try. I long to warm and comfort others, but alas, I do not feel drawn to those around me here. I am cold towards them, and this, too, is wrong of me. The months of captivity had altered Alexandra almost beyond recognition. She looked constantly exhausted and in pain. It appeared that in the final months of her life, Alexandra had finally accepted the family situation. But with that, she lost all hope of a positive outcome. Rasputin's warning was constantly on her mind. She had lost her crown, and it seemed only a matter of time before she lost her precious son. In July 1918, that warning seemed to come true in an unimaginably brutal way. On the 16th of July, 1918, Alexandra and her entire immediate family were viciously murdered in a cellar in Ekaterinburg. Tsaritsa Alexandra's legacy is a complicated one. The contempt and hatred felt for her during her lifetime and expanded upon during the communist regime has created an image of an overbearing, fanatical, evil woman hell-bent on Russia's destruction. Her strong will and natural reserve has helped to create a version of Alexandra as haughty and cold. In James Bolton's opinion about her legacy... Gender plays a huge role. You know, it's a lot easier to blame the woman than it is the man. There's also a sense of, and you get this all the time in history with kings, and to a lesser extent with ruling queens as well, but it's very dangerous to criticise the person in charge, so you uh, instead criticise their advisors, you know, their ministers or their interfering wives. And so... So often in history, you see women cast as either sort of, you know, the Virgin Mary or Eve or the Jezebel. And you can see this very clearly with her family. So her eldest sister, Ella, was married um, to a very prominent Russian noble, Grand Duke Sergei. And she had an amazing reputation of being this almost saintly character. And Alex is sort of damned as the, what the press called her, the German bitch. And, you know, that's got a lot to do with her position. It's got a lot to do as well with the fact that no one liked her at the time. She made no attempt to disguise her distaste for Russian society. She wasn't a particularly warm or outgoing person. She never sort of went to parties, or if she did, she left early. And that's a huge part of of queenship or empresship in this case. And then, again, something I mentioned just, just then, her nationality didn't help as well when it came to the war. She was seen as this German double agent. And while, say, the British royal family were able to change the narrative, you know, change their name 
to Windsor. She didn't do that and she hid away as well. So no one really knew who she was or what she was doing because no one saw her. You only got these snippets of innuendo. And when that happens and you haven't got control of the narrative, you can get these all these stories circulating, all these rumours, all these smears that have remained almost unchallenged for decades and decades after her death. In discussion about Alexandra's legacy, Helen Rappaport states, I think, I think she and Rasputin, but particularly Rasputin, have been blamed. I mean, they were victims of circumstances, but they were also brought down by their own folly. And Alexandra's intransigence about reform, about change, I think Nicholas at times would have capitulated to change and moved Russia forward politically. There wouldn't have been any need for a revolution. So there, there are other alternatives. I think Alexandra's stubbornness was her downfall, her, her reticence, her mistrust of people didn't help. If she had been more open, things could have been different. You know, you can't make cut and dried accusations of blame. It's a very complicated situation. A lot of things went wrong right from the moment Alexandra arrived that caused her to retreat. Basically, the Romanov family hated her. If the revolution hadn't happened in February, I think it within weeks, if not days, the Romanov family themselves would have removed Alexandra because they saw her as such a threat, uh, a destabilizing threat. One of the real triggers in terms of her, her being hated was purely and simply because she was German. The German woman, the Niemka, and that stuck, and it stuck throughout the war, it stuck when it came to the Romanov asylum. Had she shown her real self, her real kindness, she could actually was a very kind and loving and generous friend. But that's to half a dozen some people who knew her. But the people in the wider family didn't know that side of Alexandra. All they saw was this stiff and starchy, very judgmental woman. In a way, that was all self-created. History is a never black and white. It is a thousand different shades of grey. The same can be said about women in history. Alexandra is neither a saint nor a villain, but a complex and nuanced woman. Alexandra's legacy is inextricably linked with some of the most infamous people and events of the 20th century. The legend and the myth often outweigh the actual woman's story, a multifaceted woman who is both a victim and an agent of her own fate. <laughs>